1956, Lewis Mumford, arguably our greatest critic of the built environment and of architecture of the last century, turned 61 years old. He was at the top of his game. In eight years, he'd win the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor you can get in the United States, along with T.S. Eliot, Carl Sandburg. 30 years earlier, he had put the Chicago School of Architecture on the map. He elevated the reputation of Louis Sullivan, who the adjacent ballroom is named after, and then of Sullivan's chief draftsman, a guy by the name of Frank Lloyd Wright, who this room is named after. And at the age of 61 in 1956, Lewis Mumford sat down and wrote one of his greatest essays for architectural record. In it, he didn't write about Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Sullivan. He didn't write even about architecture. He wrote about the state of aging in America. He said at no point in any society had any group been so rejected as older people today. He said, yes, we'd added years to life, but we added them at the wrong end. But his purpose wasn't to be despairing, it was to fix this problem, and he had two prescriptions. He said, first of all, let's not infantilize older people, let's not encourage them to be children again, to have a second childhood, what Betty Friedan years later would call the youth short circuit. And then he did something else. He said, most important of all, we need to do battle with age segregation. In fact, the title of his architectural record article for older people, not segregation, but integration. That very same year, 1956, a real estate agent in Peoria, Arizona, Big Ben Schleifer, put the finishing touches on a community of 125 people, the first retirement community in America. Big Ben Schleifer, you wouldn't guess it by the name, he wasn't the New Yorker's architectural critic, um, but he was no less an idealist than Lewis Mumford, and he was trying to solve the same problems, and it was personal for Big Ben Schleifer. He was a New Yorker who'd been forced to move to the Arizona desert because of asthma, but returned home frequently, and one of his major purposes in doing that was to visit an elderly friend who was languishing in a nursing home, alone, rejected, with no purpose in life, essentially whiling away the final hours uh, at death's door. And he was so appalled at this situation that when he returned to Phoenix, to Peoria, Arizona, he decided to do something about it to fix it. And what he decided to do was to create a kibbutz for older people. Schleifer was Jewish, he was influenced by the socialism of the kibbutz movement, and he thought, hey, this is gonna work for older people in a society that has no place for them. He created a community that was built around leaning into the two things that Lewis Mumford said we had to avoid at all costs. The community's name was Youngtown. It was all about being a kid again, graying as playing, and it was the first age-segregated retirement community in the country. In part, Schleifer was in favor of age segregation because he didn't want to pay, have his residents pay school taxes. He wanted it to be affordable to people who were living on Social Security. But it turns out that those two principles, a second youth and age segregation, went hand in hand in a deeper way because the presence of actual children punctured the illusion of being a kid again. If everybody was old, nobody was old. And I don't have to tell you whose vision captured the day. In fact, by 1957, the following year, Youngtown was featured on Dave Garraway's Wide Wide World morning TV show, watched by four million people, among them a man by the name of Delbert E. Webb, who decided that this was the future, and directly across the street from Youngtown and its 125 houses, he built Sun City, which today I think numbers 70,000. Um, and Webb transformed not just the dream for later life, but the American dream. He coined the phrase, the golden years, and proved that if you build it, they will come, and they'll keep coming. But now we have the benefit of, of hindsight, and 
even 40 years after Youngtown's openings, the fundamental flaw of this approach to life was already vividly in evidence. Youngtown was again in the national news, only this time it wasn't a fawning morning daytime TV portrait by Dave Garraway. It was in the headlines of all the major newspapers in the country, including the New York Times, for ejecting a pair of grandparents for the crime of harboring their grandson. Chaz Cope, who was running from an abusive father, had no place to go but to, to come to his grandparents. They took him in with open arms, and the Youngtown community reacted not by bringing them meals, not by embracing them, but by finding them $100 a day and planting a scarlet letter-like sign on their lawn, harboring children. The New York Times pointed out that dogs were allowed at Youngtown, not kids. So I don't want to put all of the onus on places like Youngtown and Sun City. They were pivot points in a century-long transformation in American society. We started the 20th century as the most age-integrated society in the world. In fact, we didn't even know how old we were. In the 19th century, people didn't even celebrate birthdays. If you ask somebody their age, it would be like asking somebody their blood type today. You'd never even think to do it. We ended the 20th century as the most age-segregated society in the world. Some have described America today as a state of age apartheid. And is it any surprise in a state of age apartheid that people are talking about a generational war of kids versus canes as a gray wave of greedy geezers takes future generations to the cleaners? Is it any surprise, any shock in the most age-segregated society in the world that we have rampant ageism? Age segregation is the soil in which ageism takes root. Is it any surprise that in the most age-segregated society in the world, the former Surgeon General Vivek Murthy has described loneliness as the single greatest public health epidemic in America today, equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. The two loneliest groups, you guessed it, older people and younger ones. So I'm 61 today, the age Lewis Mumford was when he wrote that article, and I'm not alone. Today, it's the first year, 2019, in American history we've got more people over 60 than under 18. We've become the more old than young society. Um, and what was possible, what we could get away with under different circumstances, we can't get away with under these new demographics. We need to transform the organization of society from one that runs against the grain of human development and thriving to one that runs with it. But that's where the good news is. We now know after decade after upon decade of research on kids, on older people, that the needs and the assets of the generations fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. I spent the first 15 years of my career working with children, and if I had to distill what I learned from that period is that young people need support from adults more than anything else. In fact, Yuri Brenner, the great child development expert of the last 50 years, Cornell professor, co-founder of the Head Start program, at the end of his life was asked by a journalist, he said, Yuri Bronfenbrenner, you've written 20 books, 1,000 articles, what did you learn? He said, what every child needs is at least one adult who's irrationally crazy about them. And that's what we've learned at the same time about older people that those of us in our 60s and 70s and beyond need to be irrationally crazy about the next generation. The Harvard study of adult development, I believe in its 83rd year, the most important study of human thriving across adulthood, found that happiness is love, full stop, in the words of George Valent, who led the study for 40 years, but that there's a direction to all that connection. Older people who bond with younger people who support them, who get involved in their lives, are three times as likely to be happy as those who fail to do so. The real fountain of youth, it turns out, it's the fountain with youth. And the other good news is that this isn't just in theory and academic research on human development, but all over the globe we're seeing a renaissance of Big Ben Schleifers of age integration of social innovators in Singapore and Finland and the UK, all over America, who are bringing the generations together. I went to the Mount 
Providence, Mount St. Vincent, and West Seattle, a 400-person CCRC, where each of the four floors has a preschool built into it to create a multi-generational neighborhood. There's a 500-child waiting list for that preschool. In Cleveland, I went to see Judson Manor, an upscale retirement community there perched between the Cleveland Clinic and Case Western. And when I showed up on a gray November day, there were 25 Swedish social scientists uh, there to greet me. When the Scandinavians are coming to Cleveland in November to come up with new ideas for a better society, you know you're onto something. And what they were onto was so simple. They were providing free housing to graduate music students because the residents of Judson Manor love music. What started out with efficiency turned into humanity. I met a 93-year-old woman there, Carla, who lived next door to a young violist who became engaged to another young violist. And when the young couple planned their wedding, they didn't invite Carla to the wedding. They asked her to be in the wedding party. <laughs> humanity out of efficiency. And so I'm here to say that there are a few lessons that one can extract from these stories. One is an ethos. Rather than trying to be young, we need to be there for those who actually are. Also, the power of innovation, people being as creative and bringing the generations together as we've been at splitting them apart, and a challenge. We got lots of big Ben Schleifers creating things like Judson Manor, like the Mount in Seattle. We need more Dell Webbs to scale these efforts uh, at a level that's commensurate with the need and with the opportunity. So I'll invoke Lewis Mumford again and say, we can fix this. But you know what? It can fix us. It can reconnect us with a fundamental part of the human experience we've been in danger of squandering, which is that the generations need each other in that beautiful, ongoing unfolding of the cycle of life. Lewis Mumford said that every generation revolts against its parents and falls in love with its grandparents. And here's one case where he was not the original thinker. Every faith tradition, every culture has always believed in that precept. And my favorite evocation comes from uh, the Greek proverb, society grows great when older people plant trees under whose shade they shall never sit. I can think of no better benediction for how we can make the most of the multi-generational world already washing over us.